Romans 5. <coughs> we are slowly starting to move, <coughs> move along. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, slowly starting to move right along. We spent a couple weeks in Romans 4. We'll spend a couple weeks in Romans 5. Um, we won't really slow down again until we get to Romans 8. We're really going to slow down at Romans 8. I'm looking forward to that. So. Romans 8 has been called the best chapter in the entire Bible. I am quick to agree in sentiment with that. It's just glorious. So, so we'll, we'll, we're not going to rush through, but we're not going to um, slow down as much as the next few chapters. Uh, but like I said, next week is Bible school, so we'll meet and do something different. So it'll be two weeks before we pick back up uh, in Romans. But Romans 5, uh, verses 1 through 11 is what we're going to look at tonight. And, and really, you know, as we have looked at the argument that Paul has made up until this point, uh, we, we kind of constantly have to remind ourselves where we've been so that we know kind of where we are. Uh, and if you, don't know, if you don't know where you've come from, it's hard to know where you are. And it's easy for us week in and week out as we study something to forget the context of what has already been said. And so Romans 5, 1 through 11, we're going to read it, and then I just want to quickly recap where we've been, and then we'll look in particular at it. Romans 5 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. In terms of biblical interpretation, one of the most important words that you will ever run across when reading the Bible is the word therefore. It is a trailer hitch. It connects everything that comes after with everything that came before. Chapter 5 begins with that word therefore. That's why it's important that we remember what we have looked at up until this point. Uh, we've seen through chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4 things like this, that God's righteous wrath is being poured out on the sinfulness of humanity. That, that's what Paul's getting at in chapter 1, that the wrath of God is being revealed against all ungodliness, that, that God is just in his wrath because we have turned our backs on God. We have, have, have known things about God, yet we chose to go our own way, and therefore people, all people are sinful and are justly deserving of God's wrath. God is just in pouring his wrath out on sinful humanity. Uh, but that Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection, has made salvation possible. That God did the work of making salvation possible. And that salvation is received by faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in what God has done for us on the cross. And Abraham then becomes the, the example, the, the uh, first example scripturally for Paul, at least in this sense, of justification by faith, because Scripture says that Abraham believed God, he had faith in God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So Paul uses that to show um, the centrality and the necessity of, of faith as essential for salvation. So that's where we've been. That's what Paul's getting at. And he says, therefore, so the argument begins to shift toward some of the practical implications of God bringing about salvation. You know, Paul, you got to remember, is, is, is doing a very strategic, very methodical argument. He's, he's giving his case to the church in Rome of this is the gospel that I believe. This is the gospel that I preach. This is what my ministry is about. He's introducing himself to them theologically. And so he, he's built the foundation for salvation. Now he's going to begin in chapters 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, 8, 
to, to look at some of the practical implications of that salvation and what that means just in terms of, uh, of, of our relationship with God. And then he takes a little detour in chapters 9, 10, and 11 and talks about uh, the issue of Israel and, and, and the Jews and, and what about them and how does all that fit into God's plan. And he picks back up in chapters 12, 13, 14, and 15, really driving home, this is how the gospel is lived out. So that's really where Romans is going. So chapter 5 kind of begins to shift away from, you know, this people are sinful, God is gracious, you need faith, to why any of that matters. What's the point? Well, what's the benefit of salvation? Now, that's the, kind of the question that Paul's getting at. Because you see, uh, we are quick to, to buy into a, a, a semi-lie. It's not, it's not really a full lie. It's not a half-truth. It's a semi-lie. And that is, we, we tell people, you want, you want God to save you so you go to heaven when you die. If that's why God saved us, why do we then live the rest of our lives until we go to heaven when we die? If the point of salvation is just to go to heaven when we die, why doesn't God just take his own home as soon as we come to faith in Christ? Because that's not the sole point of salvation. That's the retirement plan. <laughs> you know, that, that, God, God, God says, you know, you sign up for my team, and this is what you get when it's all said and done, but there's work to be done in the meantime. And so there are some benefits to salvation, not in the sense of, of perks, but they are perks for us. Uh, and, and I want us to look at three benefits that we see here tonight. In Romans 5, three benefits of salvation. The first is peace. The first benefit of salvation is peace. What it says there in verse 1, we have been justified by faith, therefore we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first benefit of salvation, peace, ultimately peace with God. In order for us to have peace with God, we have to understand where we stood with God prior to salvation. And this is it, it, hard for some people because we, we like to think of ourselves as pretty good people, as just pretty decent folk. And if you've read Romans 1, Romans 2, and Romans 3, you realize we're not decent. We're, we're sinful. We're wicked. We're awful. But God is gracious and God loves us, and so God makes salvation possible. But before... <coughs> that before we come to faith in Christ, there is a, a, a situation where we stand with God. And verse 10 tells us uh, there where we stood with God, what our relationship with God was before coming to Christ. And we were enemies of God. Now, I remember teaching on this one time in another setting, and, and I made that comment, and, and, and a lady said, now, wait a minute, I, I, I was not an enemy of God. I, I just wasn't somebody who was trusting in God. And, and the thing is, there's not a middle ground. You're either on God's side, you're either a Christian, or you're an enemy of God, a non-Christian. There is no middle ground. You can't straddle the fence. You can't have it both ways. You're either one or the other. You're an enemy of God. See, from man's perspective, from our perspective, being an enemy of God means we deny God. And we seek to have our own way. That's what we're doing when we live without God. We deny that God has control and the right to, to have control of our lives, and therefore we deny Him with our lives, we deny Him with our actions, we deny Him with our attitudes, and, and we want to go our own way. We want to do it our way. We want to be like Frank Sinatra, and at the end of our lives say, we did it my way. The problem is that's not how we were created. We weren't made to live that way. We were made to be people who follow God. See, sin ultimately is an act of hatred toward God. Sin is an act of hatred toward God because it is a rejection of the better way God has for us. Think about it. God has all this wonderful life that He wants to give us. And when we don't trust Him, when we turn our backs on Him and go our own way and live, a, live uh, before we come to faith in Christ as an enemy of God, what we are saying is, okay, God, I don't think you have my best interests at heart, and ultimately what I'm doing shows that my heart is inclined to hate you. I don't know many people, I mean, there are some, but I don't know many people who would say they hate God, but our lives oftentimes show that in how we live 
uh, apart from God. So for man's perspective, being an enemy of God means that we deny God and seek to have our own way. But from God's perspective, being an enemy of God means that his wrath is being poured out against us. It means that judgment awaits us. God is the king of the universe. And the king of the universe looks at us and he sees enemies. Looks at fallen, sinful humanity apart from faith in Christ and sees enemies. People who are opposed to him. And God's going to win the day because he's the king of the universe. The king is going to win. So what's awaiting enemies from God's perspective? Wrath and judgment. That's what's awaiting us. So that's what it means to be the enemy of God. Justification, that making right with God. You know, and, and, and here's the way to see justification, just from an easy illustration point, is you were once far from God, and now you're close to God. That's the act of justification. God took you from being far from God and brought you close to Him. You didn't bring yourself. So justification changes the relationship from one of being an enemy of God to one of peace. Now, peace is not simply the absence of conflict. Peace is not, if you go to the dictionary, open up Webster and say, look up the word peace, the first definition will be some variation of the absence of conflict. That is not what biblical peace is exclusively. Biblical peace is the idea of a complete change of disposition towards someone. Now, some of our um, more liturgical brothers and sisters kind of get this, whether they understand it or not, when they talk about the passing of the peace. I don't know if you've ever been in a church service where they have this, the giving of peace, the passing of peace, those kind of things. It, it, it's an interesting thing when they do it. It's, it's kind of simple, you know, peace be unto you, um, that kind of stuff. But it's the idea of the disposition of the person. It doesn't mean you're in conflict necessarily. But it just means you're changing your attitude toward that person. It's an attitude of peace. And that's what it means to have peace with God. Before God's wrath was directed toward us. Now we are recipients of his favor. It, it, you know, we can say well, we're at peace with God. That means God's wrath is no longer toward us. But that's only one side of it. The absence of conflict is only one half of peace. It also means that God's disposition toward us has completely changed. God is now favoring us. Whereas before we deserved God's judgment, now we receive God's grace and God's goodness and God's blessing and God's favor. All of that comes with being at peace with God. So the first benefit of salvation is peace. The second benefit of salvation is grace. Verse 2, through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Grace is God's rich and undeserved favor toward us. I've said it numerous times and it's a good definition. Grace is knowing that there is nothing that I can do to make God love me any more than he always does. Or he doesn't. There's nothing I can do that can make God love me any less than he already does. That's grace. That's the disposition God now has toward us. God's rich and undeserved favor toward us. Through justification by faith, we have obtained access. There's access into this grace. What is that talking about? Access into grace. It's kind of a weird phrase. But you almost have to look at it in the sense of royal language. Picture the fact that when you were an enemy of God, if you had showed up at God's throne room as an enemy, what would have happened to you? Off of your head. Now, you're no longer an enemy of God. You're at peace with God. You're a child of God. So when you show up at the throne room of heaven, what happens? Come on in. You're welcome. That's access into grace access into this grace. Hebrews 4.16 gives us this. It says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 
You know, we don't live in an era of royalty with great power. There are kings and queens, but it's a different kind of concept from, from centuries ago. But you know, if you go back, you know, the story of Esther is a good illustration of this. When Esther wants to go see the king, her husband, you know, if he doesn't give the right signal, she dies. That's the idea of grace, the showing of grace, the granting of access, the giving of permission, the, 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 the ability to, 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 to come into the presence of the king. That is grace. Our standing with God has now given us access to him so we can come knowing that in our time of need we find what we need, which is him. It's grace. See, grace gives us confidence that we don't have to be afraid of God's rejection. That's a glorious thing to think about. The fact that we can come into the presence of God, we can come to Him, and because of Jesus Christ, we know He will not reject us. We don't have to be good enough. We don't have to have our act together. All we have to do is trust in Him, and that is enough. You see, Jesus suffered our rejection so we can experience God's acceptance. Grace reminds us that God is merciful to us when we don't deserve mercy and we don't deserve it. We don't deserve God's mercy. Jesus bore our unmerciful punishment so we could know God's good faith. That's the beauty of grace. How dare we presume upon that grace? How dare we presume that, that, that God... You know, looks at us and thinks we're all kinds of wonderful just because we did a good deed that day. <laughs> it's all because of Jesus. See, grace and peace then lead us to rejoice in hope. That's what it says there. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. There's hopeful joy. Joy in the glory of God. The goal of our lives, whatever comes, should be for God to be glorified. See, that, that's, the amazing, that's really how you can tell if somebody's a true believer or not. One of many ways. But one of the ways is, is you know, before you're a, a Christian, you are very self-centered. We're all self-centered people by nature. But you are living for yourself. You are living to please yourself. You are living for your own benefit. When you come to know Christ, you see the bigger picture. You see that God is worth it. And so the purpose, the direction, the goal of your life changes from being one of pleasing yourself to God getting the glory, no matter what comes your way. Philippians 1.20, many of you probably know Philippians 121 for me to live as Christ to die again. But the context of verse 120 is important. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body. You can change that to Christ will be glorified in my body. Same concept. Whether by life or by death. Let that sink in just a second. It is possible. This is a hard pill to swallow. I admit this. It is possible that the way you will give God the greatest glory is not by how you live, but by how you die. We should never for a second think that the sufferings we go through in our lives are somehow useless. God uses those and wants us to use those sufferings to bring Him glory, even in the middle, in the midst, the depths of our suffering. Something. It says we rejoice, verse we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces. It does something. It's not just pointless. It's not just, you know, going through pain for the sake of pain. It's actually doing something. You know, some, some people will argue, um, some Eastern religions, you know, uh, Buddhism, that, that suffering, you know, the way you achieve um, salvation is by ridding yourself of all suffering. Christianity says suffering is doing something in your life. That suffering is actually how you glorify God through your suffering. It's producing something. It's producing endurance, patience, resolve, 
steadfastness, commitment. All those are synonyms of the word endurance. You know, those of you who've been married, marriage ain't always easy, is it? Okay? It's not always easy. I, I have learned, as both a minister and as a husband, two parallel truths about marriage. The difficulties you face will do one of two things. They will either tear you apart or they will draw you closer together. Suffering does much the same thing. It produces endurance, character, steadfastness, commitment. You know? It shows who's truly committed. You know, we, unfortunately, we live in a world where we have a lot of fair-weather Christians. I, I, use, I joke with people that when it rains, Baptists don't come to church because they don't like getting sprinkled. Uh, that's why the Baptists don't come to church because when it rains. <laughs> so, 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 they take y'all to get some of y'all to get back. But, um, but you know, it's really kind of sad. Because think about it. If it comes a really bad rainstorm, there are a lot of Christians, they won't even darken the door of church because it's too wet. But let them have a football game ticket, and they will sit out there in a hurricane. <laughs> I, I mentioned that to a friend of mine one time. He said, well, they've got a lot of money invested in those tickets. I'm thinking their eternity is invested in the church. What's it worth to them? They've got a lot of sunshine soldiers. So that three times real fast. They come when it's easy, and when it gets difficult. And suffering produces endurance. It shows your Commitment. It also produces character. It shows what's really there. You know, character is who you are in the dark and nobody's looking at character. It's who you really are. We're really good at putting on front with people. Um, character is what's really there and suffering will show what's really there. You, you, you want to know somebody's a complainer? Put them in a time of suffering. They'll complain about it. And you want to know somebody's a person of prayer? Put them in time of suffering. Go pray. Suffering shows what's really there. Uh, we see this, Job 23 10. I love this verse. <coughs> Job says, He knows the way that I take, and when he has tried me, I shall come out as good. Suffering refines us, it removes that which is not pleasing to God. 1 Peter 1 6 and 7 says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, I think that's really good to hear that, if necessary. Uh, we, we, don't ever, we should never think for a second. We've we got, we got to get away from this attitude that God doesn't ordain suffering. Sometimes, suffering is the best thing that can happen to us. And God wills it to happen. You can write me angry letters later if you want to. Um, if necessary. Sometimes suffering is just necessary. Sometimes I suffer because I'm my own worst enemy and I do stupid things. Okay, there's sometimes, and sometimes you suffer because we live in a fallen world. But there are times we suffer because God knows that's what we need at that moment. Okay? You have been grieved by various trials so that... The tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Suffering is to bring glory to God. It's a test. It produces endurance. It produces character. And character produces hope. Expectation, longing for the future. Present suffering makes us realize that there must be more to life than what we are presently going through. Suffering gives us perspective, and it ultimately produces a longing for the future that God has prepared for His people. You know, the people who long for heaven the most, the ones who have been through hell on earth, they long, desperately long, for the glory that awaits on the other side. You know, if you get your best life now, you got a problem. Okay? Your best life is not now. If you're a Christian, your best life is always ahead. The best days are always in the future. If you're not a Christian, this is your best life now. It's only going to get worse. See, 
hope does not disappoint, one day our hope will be realized that the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives is the guarantee of God's future promise. God seals his promise with his Holy Spirit to remind us, you know, to comfort us. The, the, the word in John's Gospel, the, the, the comfort, the encourager, the Greek word is the paraclete, the one who comes alongside and calls to us. Keep going. Keep going. It's going to get better. Keep running the race. Keep going. Suffering is doing something. Don't just think it's wasted. See, God is at work even when we are not aware of it. Let me ask you, have any of y'all ever been to Enterprise, Alabama? Any of you ever heard of Enterprise, Alabama? Okay. I don't remember where it is, but I've heard of it. It's in Alabama. <laughs> 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 Uh, it's in <laughs> south, east, central Alabama, somewhere along that, that line. If you ever go to Enterprise, Alabama, and I don't think any of us will ever have a reason to go to Enterprise, Alabama, but in the middle of town in Enterprise, Alabama, is a monument to the bull weevil. <laughs> There's a monument to the bull weevil. Here's the story behind it. You know, the bull weevil destroyed cotton. In the mid... 19 teens, the boll weevil swept through Enterprise. It was a poor town. A bunch of poor cotton farmers barely getting by. And their crop got wiped out. Well, there was a businessman in town who said, you know what? Let's plant peanuts. We got the soil for it. Let's plant peanuts. They planted peanuts and made a fortune. Totally turned the town around. They went from being a poor little speck in the town to being a major producer of peanuts. So a few years later, the town leaders got together and said, you know what, we're going to make a monument to the bull weevil. <laughs> the, the bug that saved our town. Now, now that, that tells me something. And that is, you know, what you're going through right now may look like it's pretty bad. But God can take what looks really, really bad and make something better on the other end of it. You know, there may be some bull weevils in your life right now that seem pretty bad, and down the road you may make a monument to those bull weevils and say, that thing that I thought was so awful actually made me the person I am today, and I thank God for it. God is at work even when we don't realize that how suffering is doing something. You know, maybe one of these days I'll take a road trip to Enterprise, Alabama and get a picture of a bull weevil monument. Because that, to me, that's just the coolest thing ever. Thank God. So, we get peace... We get grace, and third, we get better than unconditional love. You know, unconditional love sounds pretty awesome, but God's love is even better than that. It's not unconditional in the sense that it is static and unchanging. It is better than unconditional because it is in spite of our condition. It is better than unconditional. Three ways we're described there in verses 6 through 11. We're described as weak. While we were still weak, means we were unable to save ourselves. We're weak. Unable to do it. We're ungodly, which means we're incapable of doing it. Not only do we not have the ability to do it, we wouldn't do it even if we wanted to. We don't want to. We're incapable of doing it. And we're, of course, described in verses enemies of God, which means we're unwilling to save ourselves. We were completely lost. God's better than unconditional love is displayed on the cross. Verse 8 there, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's how God shows his love for us. Why did Jesus die for us? Was it because we were very lovable? We were weak, ungodly enemies of God. We are not lovable people. Jesus died for us because he loved us, not because we were lovable. God doesn't love us because we are special. We are special because God loves us. That's a fundamental difference. You know, I think my kids are pretty great. I love my kids. But I don't love my kids because they're great. I love my kids because they're my kids. God loves us and that's what makes us special. You know, if everybody's special, nobody's special. So if we're all that lovable, none of us are really all that lovable. So God loves us when we were unlovable. 
God's love was displayed on the cross, but also we are saved from God's wrath. That's past, present, and future. Our forgiveness is complete. We no longer have to fear the, the future. God may discipline us because of our sin, and we should rejoice when He does because He's treating us as His children when He does that. But we never have to fear God's eternal wrath against us. We never have to fear that God's going to zap us one day just out of anger or spite. And we get reconciliation. Reconciliation, uh, restore relationships. You know, peace with God is a restored relationship with God. And one, one of the most sad passages in the entire Bible is in Genesis 3. After Adam and Eve have taken of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it says, And the Lord God walked through the garden in the cool of the day. And he cries out, Adam, where are you? God knew where Adam was. God wasn't ignorant at that point, but the relationship had changed because of sin. The relationship was there. And you can almost hear the brokenness in God's heart that Adam and Eve have, have wasted the good gift that God had given them. And yet through the cross and through faith in Jesus Christ, we have restored relationship with God. And we can enjoy that intimacy again. We can enjoy that kind of relationship again. And, and it, it's such a sweet thing. It's not something we should take for granted, but it's something that we should definitely um, nurture and, and seek to, to have a deeper relationship with God uh, through Jesus Christ. And it's also a restored relationship with others. You realize that the leading barrier to healthy relationships is sin in our lives. Now, have you ever been in an argument with somebody? <laughs> that was not your fault. Never is. Never is, right? You know, I have never <laughs> lost an argument in my head. I've never lost an argument in my head. You know, I go back and I look over and I think, you know, if I said that, then they would say, and I said that, and it would have been perfect, and I, and I would have won. Mm -hmm. You know what that is? That's called sin. Sin is the barrier to healthy relationships in our lives. Pride. None of us deal with pride, do we? Mm -hmm. Arrogance. Selfishness. Anger. None of that creates hindrances to relationships. See, the root problem in our lives is sin. When that is taken care of, when that is taken care of, when we have faith in Jesus Christ, when we give our life to Him and that's taken care of, we will still struggle, we will still have issues, but we can now deal with that issue. We can now deal with it properly. It's not just, you know, i got to do better, i got to try harder. It's we can say, you know what, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we're sinners together. Uh, when I... When I I do premarital counseling for couples. There's two books I have to read. One of the books I have to read is a book called When Sinners Say I Do. Good book. It's good for people who've been married for a while, too, by the way. Uh, when Sinners Say I Do, because it, it reminds us that the purpose of relationships is not so that we feel good, not so that we feel complete. The purpose of relationships is to glorify God. You know, Paul said, whether well, by my life or my death, I want to honor Christ with my body. I want to glorify God in all that I do. <laughs> and so everything we do, all our relationships are to glorify God. And when there's a sin problem in a relationship, and we come to God with it, and God works in that, it becomes a beautiful picture of God's saving work in that. I've seen this happen on numerous occasions. I've seen God's grace restore broken marriages. I've seen God's grace restore broken friendship, broken families. And there's no explanation other than God did. And God gets the glory for it. See, the sin problem that causes these problems. You know, you realize before Adam and Eve sinned, there was no, no marital problems at all. And Adam and Eve didn't, get a, didn't have a problem at all. There was no issues. They were in a perfect relationship with each other because they were in a correct relationship with God. When the relationship with God gets messed up, it messes up human relationships. The reason you have problems with other people is not because they are evil and wicked, and that's the only reason. They're evil and wicked because they're not right with God. That's the issue. They get right with God, it's going to fix a lot of the other problems. 
the same with us. When we have issues, it's not because we're somehow worse than we were before, but because we let sin creep into our lives and cause a problem that we need to take to God and deal with. And sometimes that means saying the hardest words that any human will ever say. <clears throat> I'm sorry, and I was wrong. Sometimes that's a really hard, you know, we would, we would rather um, eat something really disgusting than have to say those words. <clears throat> Sometimes that's what we have to do. Because sin has that kind of effect. Because we have peace with God, because we have grace, because we have God's better than unconditional love, we can go to those people. And you know what? God's going to accept us because of faith. We do our part. We leave the rest up to Him. I've had situations in my life where I've tried to make it right with people, and they didn't want to, they didn't want to have it right. They didn't want to fix it. I had someone one time get in my face 15 minutes before Sunday morning service started and bless me out. I mean, just absolute. I was the worst thing ever. Adolf Hitler would have been a better person than I was. I mean, that's just kind of the attitude that person had toward me at that time. <coughs> Now, you want to talk about, you know, I mean, I was in tears. Chris will tell you, when I get upset, I cry. It's just my, my way I am. I was in tears. I was ready to just go home, take my toys and go home. I wasn't going to play there anymore. I was done. Okay? <laughs> but it's 11, it's 1045. I got a, I, service starts at 11 o'clock. Now, here's what's really bad about it. The person that did that to me sang in the choir. I'm sitting in the congregation, and that person's sitting up there. <clears throat> and my heart's just breaking. Absolutely breaking. And I remember something that Charles Spurgeon did whenever he would get up to preach. He'd climb numerous steps to his pulpit, and every step he would say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. And I still remember my sermon that day. It was on 1 Peter 2.9. You are a chosen people, a holy priesthood. Talking about how we as Christians ought to be different from the world and not let the... I mean, you talk about hard to preach. I got through it. That means not that person was the church. I prayed about it all week long. And I made a decision that I was going to go up that person I was going to hug them. And I did put my arm around him and I said, you know what? We may not always see eye to eye on things, but I want you to know I love you. If there's anything I can ever do for you, let me know. He went, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, words were not forming in his mouth. So I just walked off. Never brought it back up to him. He may watch this video and so it's all right. He knows what he did. Never brought it back up to him. As far as I was concerned, it was done. I was good. I made an effort. I, I wasn't holding it against him. I had done everything I could. And if it didn't work on his part, it wasn't my problem anymore. Scripture says, as far as it depends on you, try to live in peace with everyone. He had me in the hospital one time having surgery, and I showed up. It scared me to death. <laughs> Yeah, because you know, when you've done something to somebody, you know you've done something to somebody, and they show up, you don't know what they're going to say. And I showed up, prayed with him. And I said, Lord, be so good to him that he can't stand. <laughs> Sometimes that's what we got to do. And I'm not saying that, I'm not patting myself on the back at all with that. That's not the point of any of this. The point is to say, because of what Jesus did for us, we can do things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do in our own strength. That's the benefit of salvation. It radically changes our lives. We live differently because we have peace, we have grace, and we have better than unconditional love. And if that's not enough, then nothing will be. And so we live differently. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gospel that changes us and makes us live. Keep us safe as we go. It's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen.